All right, welcome back. This is another Dragonflight dungeon walkthrough. I'm a little sick this time, so my voice is going to be a little gruff, but let's get into it. This is Algathar Academy, one of the new ones. And we did this on 17 Fortified Thundering, I believe. Yeah, this is actually a pretty balanced dungeon. I'd say it's probably in the best, uh, closest the tuning that they want to do for one of the new dungeons so far and this is still a few weeks before dragonflight that i made this video all right so first start as soon as you get to this friendly area you want to make sure you pick up one of the buffs from the dragonflight guys so i think this is the haste or mastery vendor one of the two that one over there is the verse vendor the red dragonflight the crit one is off the screen here to the right and then one of these is the uh healing taken so you can choose any five percent stat buff or a healing taken buff that's the haste buff right there, it looks like, on the bronze. I think the mastery is a little bit different. It's not quite 5%, it's like a an actual number value. So you can go left to do the Veximus boss first if you want. However, in this room we went to the Overgrown Ancient side. So you have two choices, left or right. Ancient is good if you want to do a big pull with Lust. But there's also a big pull on the left you could do with Lust too, so it really doesn't matter, I don't think. In this area there's... Uh, basically just these skater flies that you have to worry about. All the other trash isn't bad, and there's three packs of mandatory trash. Technically, you wouldn't have to kill these skater flies to spawn the boss, but you at least need to take out one pack for realistic use of space. And these skater flies jump around and hit people every six seconds, and they give themselves a self-enrage for their auto attacks, and that's about it. All you gotta know about these lashers is it's hard to pick up threat. They don't really do anything. The big vile lashers, however, will put down swirlies at every targeted player's location. I think every like 10 seconds or so. So you see a bunch of swirlies appear. You just gotta step out of these and use your space wisely while you fight these. If you get hit by a swirly, it's probably gonna be a one shot on higher keys and it disorients you if it's not a one shot. I accidentally chained into these other skitterflies here. You definitely do not wanna do this because they do all of the damage in this area. And yeah, you can see several people died because if you get unlucky and get jumped by two or three skitterflies at the same time, you're probably going to die. They don't do a ton of tank damage though, unless they choose the tank for their jump. There's the detonation seed cast by the big flower. That's about it. It's a pretty straightforward pull. No frontals. Their enrage mechanic is that stacking buff you see him get. I think uh, druids can soothe off the entire stack of the buffs. And I think uh, hunter and rogue can only soothe one stack. I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure. So then you got the two other flower packs. You could actually pull all three flower packs at the same time too. Like another option is walking into this area, killing one pack of the skater flies, and then pulling all three flower packs for a huge AoE pull. And you just have to pull them back away from the other skater fly spawns. So both skater both skater fly spawns kind of make their way through the middle of the boss area at some point, like straight through the boss, and then they go back to circle their their side that they're on. So like you could you could technically avoid the patrol that's on that side of the room while you're in this area the entire time. We just pulled them on accident. Yeah, I'll let this keep playing because it's it's good to see these pulls. You probably want to stack up and move as a group since all the swirlies go right where people are baiting. And also as a tank, you may want to just have a consistent way that you kite. <clears throat> or maybe like mark yourself and pre-move as the swirlies come out so your melee know which way you're going to go. I kind of juked them right there. Because there are a lot of swirlies. I'm going to fast forward this a little bit. That's all there is to those flowers. After you kill all three big vile lashers, the boss spawns. He has a couple seconds of RP and then he spawns. And generally, let's just say that the patrol was still up like I planned. The patrol would be going like right through there, through that through this whole area right there. So that area is now off limits for the rest of the time you're in this place. So you just want to pull the boss back to like slightly off the screen here as soon as he spawns. And this guy's got some um, interesting mechanics. I think he's going to be pretty hard in high keys. So 
So, yeah, so he becomes active there. I pull him back. One thing you should know about the boss is he summons adds and waves. And every other add wave that he spawns, he makes them active and they'll start attacking you. And that's the dangerous parts of the fight. So the first wave he spawns isn't going to do anything. You just got to make sure you cleave him down. And the other thing about tanking this boss is that Bark Breaker cast he's doing right there. That is going to do a lot of damage if you don't block it or parry it or dodge it. And it also leaves a double damage debuff on you for 8 seconds. Buff right there. So it's not bad on its own, but there's a couple overlaps that come up that it is bad. So the other thing is this Germination cast. <clears throat> this is where you want to stack as a group on the tank. So they're all on my marker, and I told them we're going to move left. So you want to like slowly make your way around the boss as a group. That only Not only does that give you full uptime, but that spawns all these flowers in the same place. So they're much easier to cleave down. And get threat, etc. All kinds of benefits. So we're not done yet. This boss has one more important mechanic. Branch out. So he summons an add, and as soon as he summons that add, you gotta pick up threat, but you also should know that he's putting a bleed on the entire party for a minute. And that bleed is basically going to stack up forever until you get a clear from killing this ad that he just summoned. I like how they, how they did that mechanic. I think that's pretty good. You just kick him otherwise. Probably a two melee kick rotation can take care of him, I think. Healing touch. So here's the second wave of germinate spawn. So right after he spawns these, this is when the fight gets crazy. And he does all of his special abilities back to back. So as soon as he spawns these flowers, he's going to make them active with his 100 energy ability. You can see he's at max energy now. And this happens every other wave of adds he spawns. And then he's also going to do the tank hit at the same time. So right here, you want to make sure you have a massive AoE threat ability ready. Uh, some kind of offensive CD probably too. And a defensive CD to cover what's about to happen. So as you can see, they all spawned in like a huge radius, even even though we stacked them really well. They're, they're still going to spawn and melee people instantly if you don't get threat, which is kind of dangerous. I hope they change that a little bit. Because like in pugs, you're probably going to be looking at a, a radius like that big until people figure out how to do this boss. But uh, so you pick up the, the trees. You, you can see I already have 15 sacks of the poison that they apply on their melees, which is very dangerous. So if you don't have heavy CDs going, then you're probably going to die to that. And then he also Bark Breakers the tank right there. So right now, I have a double physical damage increase debuff, 15 stacks of a poison, and a minute long bleed that ticks every 3 seconds, I think. So it's actually a crazy overlap. <clears throat> oh, I missed it, but there's one more thing about the tree and how to drop this bleed. is As soon as that the, the branch add dies, he drops this circle on the ground right here that I'm highlighting. And if you're inside the circle, then your minute long bleed goes away. It, it, I think it goes off after like three seconds, and boom, there it is. So we took care of those adds. Now the boss is back to like 30% energy, and that means that these adds that he's spawning aren't going to become active. So this, this is an easy wave. So he basically alternates easy and hard waves. And then additionally, you may want to tell your group that on the, on, starting on the second wave of Lashers, you need to press a defensive like right after he summons him because that's when he does the big group AoE as well. His 100% energy ability summons the Lashers, does a ton of group damage. First fourth right there, yeah. But it, hit, it hit the party for like 70% of their health on a 17 fortified. So that's going to be insane on Tyrannical. Hopefully that gets some tuning. But as you can see, I also stunned the Lashers when they became active. I wanted to get, like, I think I, I thunderclapped when they were all around me, and I stunned for my second global, and then I thunderclapped again, I think, if I had Avatar going. That's it. That's Overgrown Ancient. That's going to be a crazy boss. You probably want to have Lust for it. And prepare your group for the stack mechanic and the damage that comes after the second one. This is a mini boss that you have to fight at some point. He becomes active. As soon as you get on the platform, I think he just auto combats, actually. Like, even if you're standing back here. I'm not 100% positive, but I'm pretty sure he auto combats. This guy is a very scary magic damage mob. So, a few seconds in, he'll, he'll cast Storm Slash, this, this ability right here. That's going to hit you very hard for magic damage. Probably a good chunk of your health on Fortified. I had Demo Shout up for that, so it hit me for 20% less. 
and then he summons those tornadoes. And if you saw the tornado spawn, it's very fast. Like he'll start casting, and if you don't start moving instantly out of the location, then you're gonna die. It does a ton of damage. This is a big knockback. If you have a cooldown as DPS, you could probably tank it with the tank player as well. Like tanks, you probably should never line this, but everybody else can use these four pillars and just line this cast, even though it's a huge radius. You can just stand line of sight and it won't hit you at all. <clears throat> oh, sorry about my voice. So now this is the this is the hard part of this mini boss. He's gonna storm slash twice in like five seconds, I think, because he doesn't have any other abilities queued up. So there's one storm slash, I heal it off me. And he's gonna summon a tornado, and then I think he does a second slash right there. Boom. So that'd be a good spot to use like a long defensive cooldown like monks you could use four brew there for the first slash and it would carry over for the second slash for sure once again just make sure you get knocked into the wall or you can line of sight this storm slash is not reflectable it's not dodgeable or parryable it's a magic direct attack i think it's treasable though and earth ellie and all that all right, so now we're moving over to the Croth platform. So currently th they've changed this platform a couple times, but there's four waves of ads here. These little eagles are basically just like non-impact mobs. You can knock them out pretty easy and then three more waves of ads will spawn after they die. Threat is a little bit weird. This whole, this whole dungeon has like these very spread packs that you need to figure out how to pull without letting your DPS die to threat. And you'll see it gets a little worse here in a second, too. Those little eagles just, just uh, cast peck. It's a small bleed. But it'll probably kill a DPS if they get threatened on the peck cast. So here's another wave of just the small eagles. This is wave two. They're coded to only peck one at a time. So, like, if you're... Luckily, you can't sync them up and they all peck six times at the same time. Sometimes there's mobs like that. So now you into the third wave here, you get all the small eagles, but there's also an alpha eagle. So this just gives the group a main target to attack. I couldn't get thrown off my uh, DPS player here. He's just tanking something the whole time. But the alpha eagles just basically have an easy kick. It's a AoE and rage. I think it gives them 50% more attack speed. And then you just dodge this frontal. Easy as that. This is a pretty good dungeon. I think they did a good job with this one. They don't have a ton more to tune before release. This last wave is basically the same thing. There's just there's two alpha eagles instead of one now. So the, the waves get slowly harder up until the boss. Uh, but like I was saying... I think the only things left they have to really tune on this are this next boss is a mechanic that's not working and maybe the trash at the end and that's about it. Yeah, if you guys listen to my Ruby guide, you probably think this is way more chill than Ruby. Ruby's insane. I think Azure Vaults and Naku will be pretty insane too. Alright, so this boss has some RP to warm him up first. You just gotta throw these three balls into the goal. It doesn't matter where you face while you're in the circle, just click your, your extra action button and it throws the ball. And as you can see, there's two energy meters. Um, the goal of the Searing Blaze is this one that's here from the start. And the goal of rushing winds will appear over here. And basically, you activate them by throwing three balls into the goal. But you don't have to do it right away. It's just an option. You gotta decide when you wanna do it. It's probably gonna be a healer job, to be honest. So just be close to, to attack the boss when he spawns. And he doesn't do anything for a few seconds. And then the main ability of the whole fight is this AoE he does right here. Everybody just needs to be spread. You have these circles around you. And it looks like he also 
will do double damage inside of his own hitbox, but that's not the case currently. At least it hasn't been all of beta. So you could stand like right here and just take the same amount of damage as, as if you ran out. But uh, spread for that, press something if you can. It does a lot of damage. <clears throat> and the mechanic that's not working is that he's supposed to be gaining damage every time he does that and, do, and he'll do more AoE damage on the next one. That would be crazy with current tuning. So I'm glad it's not working, but that's the way it's supposed to work. And then the point of the fight is to prevent that stacking damage by finishing one of the goals and then it'll like reset his stacks. But he hasn't actually been doing that correctly yet. So for now, just keep pressing defenses on that deafening screech, dodge the frontal. And then there's also a tank hit that he does every now and then. Now there's balls on the ground. I think the UI for this actually went away for the first uh, 40 seconds of the fight, it looks like 47 seconds in at this point. Now you have the option of completing a goal. So you, I guess you have to take two AOEs before you can do that. I'm guessing you, he's probably gonna do the AOE right now. So you, you'd actually have to plan for three no matter what. So yeah, here's the third one. So I, I guess you'd have to live this in a high key and then you'd, you'd probably want to throw in the rushing winds goal over here because that will start blowing players around the platform for the rest of the fight. It'll reset his stacks though, and that's the important thing. And then it'll also give everyone a haste buff for the rest of the fight. However, what we did here is cause the fire goal to go off first. So what the fire goal does is it gives the boss this debuff where he takes 75% increased damage, big debuff. So you wanna plan around that if you can, probably at the end of the fight, because now you have to deal with all these swirlies for the rest of the fight. All these swirlies will come down every like five or six seconds. until he dies. And you only get the the damage bonus for like 10 seconds and that's it. And yeah, that's basically it. I think his uh, tank hit is dodgeable, parryable. It also leaves a bleed if it hits you. The initial application is definitely blockable. Yeah, the fires are really annoying. And he's also got a pretty small hitbox for your melee, so it's it's hard for your melee to like get in there and hit the boss while spread out safely. His wings are really annoying. I think we're probably gonna throw in the wind goal, so you'll see what happens when we throw the wind goal in soon. I think they want the haste buff. But yeah, so you can see this this debuff right here is stacking up the damage increase from his AoE. The deafening screech but it's not currently working so we're not actually taking extra damage from the screech like we're supposed to this should put it to four now we have four stacks it's interesting i don't know what they're going to do to change that but expect some kind of difference between what's on this video for this boss and what's on launch there's the tank hit savage peck that one actually hit me i didn't parry it so you can see it's on my frames it's bleeding me out I think you can probably dwarf that. I did not test it though. Dwarf it or evoker bleed removal it. Oh, my party's getting clapped by this boss though. As you can see, it's pretty hectic now with both effects going. You got the wind. The haste is nice from the wind, but there's also like tornadoes and, and it's blowing you around and there's swirlies at the same time from the fire. It gets kind of crazy. Add thundering in and then you have like actual just bullet hell. The thing I stand in the center of his hitbox there, as you can see, I didn't take any damage extra from that AOE cast. Even though I'm a tank player, I think you would have seen a bigger health drop. Yeah, that is Croth. I think what we're gonna do now is experiment with a giant pole. And I'll kinda I'll show why it's hard and why I die to it. Otherwise I would just fast forward, but let me get to the start of that pole. Oh actually I should say you, you come across here. 
after Karoth dies, you go back to that same platform where the mini boss is, and this is like the the other intersection of going to the other side of the dungeon. So we already came from this side where the squiggly line is. Now we need to go this way. If you go the other way, then you do the opposite when you get here. Yeah, now we're heading toward Veximus. Uh, the whole Veximus wing has all these same mobs. Um, while the group is coming, I'll talk about some of these mobs. So the Arcane Forgers are the easiest. They don't really do anything. They just jump to random players for very light damage. They're kind of like Sarids, but uh, easier versions of Sarids from Atalthazar. The Mana Fiends are the dangerous part for the group. So these all cast Surge every few seconds. And Surge is just like a, a magic bolt that hits a random player. So every spare kick you have should go into Mana Fiends. The thing for the tanks you should watch out for are these battle axes. This is actually what kills me in this pull while I'm gathering it. I didn't know how much damage it did, but the tank hit that it does is very powerful. I think it's like severing slash or something. Lastly, the big mobs in these two platforms are this uh, Arcane Ravager. It's just a very high health uh, worm. It doesn't really do anything to tanks, but it'll jump at a random party member and then do a big frontal after the jump. So I'm doing a pretty poor job of grouping this. I'm just experimenting. And then I get hit by a severing slash right here. That's about to hit me from all the way over there, it looks like. So that's something to be aware of as well. And then I die just because it hits me from behind. So now I'm going to fast forward. We're going to come from a different direction. So as you can see, you, you always spawn at the beginning of the instance. You got to walk back through this friendly area. You could always swap out buffs if you ever wanted to change like halfway through the run. I'm checking mine there. I still got the haste buff. And then this is actually the start of the left side of the dungeon. So maybe it's actually good I wiped to show this. So this could have been your first lust pull. Uh, it's got those same mobs that we just talked about. The battle axe is the, it, the important tank mob. There's two surgers here, the mana fiends. And then there's the same mobs over here, plus a scepter mob that you can pull in. This double pull isn't too bad, probably until you get to super high fort keys when the surges start to kill people. There's a severing slash. I, I actually totally parried that one. It didn't hit me for anything and it didn't even give me the bleed, so I just parried it. So the only new mob here is the Spellbound Scepter. This was a recent addition to the dungeon on beta. And this just makes like a, a mandatory kick in the pool. So my buddy Luigi marked it as moon and he's gonna kick it every time it casts the uh, Mystic Blast. Mystic Blast is just a big ass AOE spell. So you can see there, I actually got hit by that Severing Slash. There's two Battle Axes in this pool. That's going to be kind of hard, actually. So Severing Slash went on me. It's bleeding me, but I'm, I've got CDs rolling, so I'm not taking too much damage. Mana Void is the other spell that the Mana Fiends cast, and it just puts a, a circle on the players. You can see Tettles off to the right with it right now. And it'll just hit them for some damage when it expires. But yeah, just make sure you do good kicks and smart AoE CCs to help your friends out. So this is coming from the other side. The, the big pull that I tried is off that way, and we'll get there in a minute. But this is another area that you can do a, an easier version of that pull. This is that big Arcane Ravager mob that I talked about earlier. He's got a, a bunch of the little guys with him, so he's not. this is a really easy pull, to be honest. All he does is charge and then breathe. Vicious Lunge is going out. Doesn't do a lot of damage yet. I recuse it well. But yeah, looking good. You can kind of compare this uh, Arcane Ravager mob to the Avalry and Junkyard. It's pretty much the same mob. I'm chaining in more of the little worms. Because the Arcane Ravager has like triple the health as anything else here. Yeah, there's not a lot to talk about on these pulls, which is nice. It's nice to have some breather pulls every now and then. All right, so now we get to the, the harder pulls in this area. So all these 
packs and the, these three packs have this new mob called the Unruly Textbook, I think. Yeah, so right there, that's the new mob. Uh, this pack has one, the pack over here has one, and the backpack has two of those plus a scepter. So the textbooks are mandatory kicks or stops because they do this ability, Monotonous Lecture. Pretty good ability name, honestly, for their mob name. But as soon as that finishes the, the wind-up cast, then he's going to subdue a player for like a six-second channel or something. So you just want to make sure you kick the wind-up wind cast there. And then all other spare kicks should go into Surges or Mana Voids. Probably Surges. Mana Voids, you can kind of... Mana Void, you have, a, you have a few seconds to realize you're about to take some damage. Surges are pretty much instant. As soon as we group them, we beamed them. This pack we're gonna control really well if I remember right. Where I'd use my AoE Silence, Devil's uses Beam, and then I use Shockwave after the Evoker knock right there. There's your Shockwave, etc. But there were two textbooks in this pool, pulling the left and the, and the right group at the same time. So we had two mandatory assignments on those. And then all other kicks went into Surge. And I'll have an auto marker on this this video once it's all set up as well. I've got a buddy helping me prepare one for this season. So this this pull has three mandatory kicks. You got two textbooks. The other one's right there. And then you got this spellbound scepter. So the textbooks do the the subdue channel. And then the spellbound scepter, if you remember, has the huge mystic blast AoE. So this is a solo pull for sure. Like you don't ever want to do this with any other mobs unless you have a actual ton of AoE CC. The other last priority thing to stop is this Arcane Rain ability. And it just like constantly puts out swirlies on the ground that everyone has to dodge and they're pretty lethal, to be honest. So if you have like every stop worked out in a coordinated group, then you could also coordinate Arcane Rain and just have someone stop it every time it starts. To be honest though, it's, it's like really last priority. So worry about everything else first. So this boss coming up is actually, I think, one of the best designed bosses I've seen for a while. This is a really cool boss. You can do, you can choose to have the group deal with the mechanics, or you can have the tank basically solo the most of the job. So you could probably tank him in the middle if you want, but I think anyone doing a pug or a coordinated group, you want to pull him off to the edge somewhere, like right off the bat. Just have him away from this uh, center ring because there's orbs that spawn in that center ring throughout the entire fight and everyone needs to help soak or just have the tank soak them for the whole fight. So you can see one coming right here. One's going to come from this direction. It's kind of like a uh, Rigalon, the way the moats work, but you have to soak them instead of kill them. So as soon as I soak that orb, I got a debuff for 20 seconds and that just makes it so that if I soak the next orb, it'll do 100% more damage to me than what that one did. If you sell it, it did like absolutely nothing on the first one. So you can definitely take like three to four, probably five to six orbs before you get dispelled by your healer. Healers really shouldn't have to dispel anybody else in the group. All the other players can just have their debuffs expire after 20 seconds. So I'm just playing goalie. Uh, one thing you should know if you're going to do the strat, your party members should definitely stay on like the outsides of the room somewhere over here in this region so that your blasts because the boss does a huge frontal blast the blasts are going to like vary from anywhere from there there you know going toward the middle of the room because you're also soaking orbs at the same time so just tell your party group group members to chill on the outside of the room there's a blast right there that does decent damage and i think the most dangerous parts are when that overlaps with like a fourth orb soaking or like a fifth orb soak at the same time now the only other thing you have to worry about as a tank is this arcane fissure. Uh, he's going to start spawning puddles under players, so you're going to have to move a little bit. I think what you should probably do with this is move the boss around the room so that you get to a more clear area when he's doing this arcane fissure cast. And we're not super coordinated at this yet, but I do kind of do it here. You just move to a more clear area. Someone got that orb while I was moving. That was really good. And now we're here for a little bit. I could have moved a little bit farther too. Those puddles on the ground come from the DPS and the healer getting the arcane bomb, I think it's called, mechanic. 
and that just leaves the puddle and does some damage to the, the group member when it expires. Here's the bomb, yeah, so it's dropping into one, and then boom, there's a puddle while the tank's doing the rest of the jobs. And that's why I think the tank should do almost all the orb soaks, because people are going to be off the boss quite a bit for that mechanic. That was a pretty hard overlap right there. He's dropping puddles, he's doing a beam, and I and also thundering came at the same time. Luckily, I think someone soaked an orb. Two of the orbs, I think, hit the boss, though. And if you saw that, it did like maybe 40% of the, uh, the group's health when the orb hit. It wasn't too bad. But yeah, that's Vex Miss. I think this would be a really cool boss to min max and um, figure out exactly how you want to do it as a tank. All right, so we're moving across this bridge. This is the left side of the dungeon again. Eximus could have been the first boss, but in this case, he was the third boss. This pull has a battle axe, a scepter, and two mana fiends. Same mobs as before. The scepter just needs to be kicked. The battle axe does the big tank bleed that you should be aware of, and then all other kicks should go into the uh, mana fiends for surge. Arcane Rain is going down. You can see that those small animations there, they're really hard to see. They are very deadly if you get hit by one of them. Oh, so I actually shocked. I storm bolted that Arcane Rain. But it looks like it didn't even matter, actually. Those, uh, all those Sprullies actually finished like he did the entire channel. That's actually really interesting. I didn't notice that till now. So maybe just don't stop them. Maybe just dodge. Anyway, so this is that same big pull that I died on earlier. I'm just coming at it from a different direction. This direction is a lot easier because you start with these easy worms instead. And something I didn't know until I was looking at this video before I posted this was this battle axe. Uh, well, this pull rather has one battle axe here and in that four pack that's over here. So there's actually two of this pull and they can stack on you. The bleeds can stack, which is very scary. But there's also a scepter. So someone's got a mandatory kick that guy. Some more worms, and then this, uh, oh, it's a three-pack, sorry, I thought it was a four-pack. But yeah, so we've, now we've got two Battle Axe guys. Uh, I think three or four Surgers. And then a bunch of worms. And the big Arcane Ravager worm. I would probably not advise this pull, but this is a, this is a science pull. Let's see if we could live it. Yeah, you can see it definitely gets really hectic. The uh, the breath from the big worm is is crazy damage if you get hit by it. That guy almost died early in the pull to it, actually. But yeah, this wraps up this area. I think you're probably going to end up wanting to skip this Arcane Ravager, this worm. He has a pretty long, wide pat, so you can just go around him, to be honest. And the reason why you want to skip him is because the last area... Trash is pretty easy, I would say. Maybe not with a full melee group, but it's pretty easy overall. And that's where we're heading now. I won't fast forward at all so you can see like how to get there from the left side. But you basically have to go back to the friendly area in the academy and then go up to the tree boss and then go up the stairs. So if anyone was playing beta <clears throat> and was watching this video, this, this video um, these mobs used to be different. They used to cast Disrupting Pulse, and they no longer do. So basically now, every single mob in this area either just Arcane Missiles the tank, which doesn't do very much damage right now, surprisingly, or they do this uh, Magic Damage Whirlwind cast, which you'll see quite often. The Whirlwind is like the really dangerous part. But I didn't know that at the time that they had just changed these mobs, so I was kind of seeing what they did in this video. So three of them started whirlwinding instantly. And I think if you stop them right now, before they reach like four seconds left on their casts, then it'll stop them and you won't take any damage. You can see this debuff appeared because I'm standing in one of their whirlwinds. But if I were to have shockwaved right now, then I think I would take no damage from this. 
as you can see, it hits pretty damn hard. Like Luigi and I are getting chunked just by getting hit by like one or two ticks. Uh, the Invoker casts Arcane Bomb. And then he casts Arcane Missiles. I think Arcane Bomb just does some damage to a random party member. But again, the, the biggest thing here is just manage these Whirlwinds as a tank. You want to like micro kite the pack out of his Whirlwind because it's pretty short, to be honest. It's like maybe that big. So you can just tank all the all the other mobs right here during that Whirlwind and just you get full up time on those mobs while you're waiting for him to finish. And maybe you use AOE CCs until you do that, but that's definitely the move. And here I was stubborn and uh, died to see how much I could take. I'll fast forward while I run back. Don't be stubborn. Looks like they're still fighting the same pack. The fact that they can keep the pack alive while I'm not there is just like, it's pretty obvious that you could just kite this forever. That's always a telltale sign that you could do that. I, I think they might change these mobs again because of that. Like you could actually just round up this entire area Get some threat on it and then tank it or, or kite it for quite a long time because those whirlwind mobs stop and whirlwind so often you really don't need to be in melee but yeah so there's there's a few other mobs here there's the invoker are the arcane missiles mobs the echo knight or the whirlwind mobs another invoker right there there used to be a call a mob called the nurse i don't know if that's still a thing uh, but I just pulled these two packs inside the room. And you can kind of line of sight the invokers in. The Echo Knights will just follow you in. Oh, there's an Ethereal Restorer. I think that, that used to be the, the mob called the Nurse. I'll see what it does. But everything else does what we've seen already. Just lots of Whirlwinds. Head out of those Whirlwinds when you can or want to. Uh, oh, Celestial Shield is the name of the ability that the Restorer does. So it puts like a big Absorb Shield on their ally, and it gives them like 50% spell haste, and it lasts 30 seconds. So you just want to purge it or kick it or stop it in some way, I think. Not a big deal. Those mobs aren't too scary at the moment. I didn't even, to do, I didn't even need to do that pull, but that was just a fun double pull because it's not too hard. And then uh, here we go for this last boss. This is the Echo of Doragosa boss. This has also been changed since I recorded this video too, but the main point of this boss is that the more mechanics you get hit by, the more exponential mechanics you cause by creating some permanent puddles on the ground that shoot missiles everywhere. You'll start to see those later in the fight. Right now, everyone doesn't have enough stacks to really cause those to happen. So tell us those two stacks, show us one stack right now. As soon as they get to four stacks now on live, then they'll spawn those puddles, and that might change by the time this the, by the time Dragonflight comes out again. But uh, in this video, at the time, it was three stacks. So as soon as Tettles gets hit by something, it'll drop a puddle on the ground. So like that breath would have given a stack to someone if it got hit. Uh, this energy bomb goes out on somebody that gives a stack when it goes off, and will leave a puddle if it's their third stack or fourth stack. And the other thing you should know is like you could spell reflect that energy bomb cast if it's casting on you as a pro warrior. You can diffuse it if you're a Brewmaster Monk back onto the boss. You just have to you have to step out of the boss's circle that it causes for a few seconds. And lastly, the the two stack buff on Tettles is currently giving him 10% more damage as well. So it's kind of like a, a little nice pat on the back for taking some uh, unavoidable mechanics. But as you saw there, Tettles got the three stacks and then dropped this permanent puddle. So that's the whole point of this boss is that that's going to ramp up over time and just be harder and harder as you go. This guy might be actually just nuts on high keys because of that. So you can see how the mechanics play out now. I won't pause it anymore, but this guy doesn't really have any tank hits. Very easy boss for tanks. You just try to move him when you can away from the puddles. He is kind of hard to move. He likes to plant and cast quite a bit. And uh, so, so there's like the reflect. So if you saw the boss do the circle around him, that's if someone successfully 
puts the energy bomb back on him. The right. Oh, I didn't back up far enough. I think Show must have defused in this case. Let's see. Yeah, so it goes on Show here. He defused, and now the boss has this circle around him. So this is a big circle. You could actually barely tank him outside of the circle if you want. But just make sure you move out in time for the hit not to do damage to you. It looks like a hit toll there for like 80% of his health as well. That does a lot of damage. Yeah, I think this is a pretty neat boss. Uh, it seems a little weird that it's going to be really easy on lower keys if people are smart about not getting hit. But then again, I think on lower keys people will get hit more often anyway. So maybe it's just a hard boss at all difficulties. <laughs> Here comes thundering. That the overlap of thundering might be kind of tough on this boss sometimes too. If you don't know thundering, you basically just have to move onto the opposite mark of somebody else before your 15 second debuff expires. Otherwise, you're gonna get stunned. But you can game it also and keep your 30% damage buff for as long as you can before you get stunned as well. You can see the area is filling up pretty heavy with all these puddles on the ground that are shooting missiles out. Just do your best to dodge. I actually got pulled into one right there, that was a little unfair. Oh, And then my, uh, my healer pulled me to him and I got hit by another one. This is how hard the boss is to move, it takes a long time. I think I just dwarfed off that that bomb on me. Although I don't think it prevented the damage, I think it just made it go off instantly instead of after three seconds. But yeah, that is Algathar Academy. That's a good dungeon. Um, I may have missed one or two things, so let me know if you guys caught anything that I didn't say. Leave them in the comments. I'll be sure to put up an auto marker weak aura on the video as well at some point for all those mandatory casts that I mentioned. And that's about it. See you guys in the next one.